Well, hello, Civil Air Patrol, Chaplain Tim Miner, the uh, Virginia Wing Chaplain and a member of the faculty for the Civil Air Patrol College's Center for Religion, Ethics, and Excellence in Leadership. Really great uh, opportunity to learn something new and do a little bit of paradigm change and uh, thinking about the future. With me today, it's my privilege to actually introduce one of my fellow classmates at the United States Air Force Academy, class of 1978. We would both go on to serve at the faculty of our alma mater at the end of the 1980s, uh, Dr. Uh, Gordon Kerfee. Uh, Gordy, thank you so very, very much for joining us uh, today. And uh, what drew me to find you actually was uh, looking at uh, the latest leadership symposium at the West Point, where you were a primary speaker, but you weren't speaking about leadership, you were speaking about followership. So many focus on leadership, in fact, our own Air Force Academy uh, uh, alma mater talks about it uh, training the leaders of the future. In Civil Air Patrol, we say that we are uh, a leader, giant leadership laboratory for our 25,000 cadets. Well, why do you think teaching about followership is important? Well, I First of all, thanks for the opportunity, Tim. I, I very much appreciate it. Um, I've been training and assessing and coaching and working with leaders from all walks of life for the last 35 years or so. And um, at this point, I think I've trained well over 20,000 leaders. Um, some of them are in the military, but many of them are working in various jobs in the corporate, uh, both the profit and nonprofit sector. And almost all of those folks that I taught, I would say that we, we did spend probably two or three or maybe four hours talking about the concept of followership. So leaders get all the attention. You know, I can't remember. There's something like 10,000 or 20,000 books on leadership. Now, the good news is I've written 23 of those books. And those, that's all you need to read. But the reality is there are just thousands and thousands of books written about leadership. There's about 10 or 15 written about followership, which is really, really interesting because Bob Dylan had a song back in the early 80s called Serve Somebody. And essentially what the song was all about was he says, you know, everybody's got to serve somebody. And the reality is individuals work for first line supervisors. First line supervisors work for mid-level managers. Mid-level managers work for directors. Directors work for VPs even all the way up to CEOs. CEOs work for boards of directors. Boards of directors work for their shareholders. So everybody ends up working for somebody in one shape, shape or fashion. And in some roles, you can spend quite a bit of time in followership roles, even though you may have a formal first-line supervisor or mid-level manager or director or senior director title, chances are you're spending a significant amount of time in that followership role, working for a leader, your boss, all right? And chances are, if you're not a good follower, you're probably not gonna get promoted. Uh, you're probably not gonna be very effective in the role. And I would suspect over time, you're gonna be looking for something else to do because people are gonna push you out of the organization. So followership is, you know, leadership gets all the attention, but followership, is really, really important. It's frankly followers who get things done in organizations. Wow, <clears throat> what a great, uh, great concept. And then the opportunity to, to rethink where we are and how we serve our respective organizations. Uh, in your uh, white paper, I saw you have a, a four quadrant model. Cordy, can you tell us a little bit about this model and, and how we might apply this model and look at it both as leaders and as followers? Yeah, thanks, Tim. I'm gonna I'm gonna share screen here. I think uh, so. Let's see if I can do this. Yeah. So here's here's our model of followership, and this is a, a model we developed over the last oh 30 years or so, and, and it's one I teach from uh, first line supervisors up to CEOs, and so it, it's a really good model, and it's one that the audience can readily apply to 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 their teams back home. So there are two dimensions of followership. So there's the first dimension is the vertical dimension, and I call this the uh, critical thinking dimension. So when thinking about the mission that has to be performed or a problem that's ar that arises, 
Do people think critically about that issue? Are they curious? Are they gathering data? Are they offering solutions? Or are they people who think, you know, really when it comes to solving problems, that's management's fault. I just need to be told what to do. I'm not gonna question. I'm not going to offer solutions. I just need to be told what to do. So that's the vertical dimension. That's the critical thinking dimension. There's also an engagement dimension. So you've got some people who are very switched on, want to see the mission succeed, uh, uh, solve problems, uh, very, very engaged with getting tasks done, getting work completed. And there are other people who think it's other folks' responsibility to get stuff done. They're disengaged. They'd rather be doing something else. And so, you know, as a, as a PhD psychologist, I can describe the world in a two by two and just about everything. And that's what we've got here. And so you get these four different followership types. You get self-starters in the upper right quadrant. And if you look at the two characteristics, these are folks who like to think for themselves who are super switched on and engaged. And my tagline for these folks is these folks seek forgiveness rather than permission. So when they see a problem, they see an issue, they solve it. They don't wait to check in with the boss. They don't make sure that everybody's okay with what they do. They see the problem. They take care of it. They go back to the boss and say, hey, I saw this. This happened. This is what I did to fix it. Uh, let's move on. One of the interesting things about self-starters is, is that they, the underlying psychological issue for them is one of patience. Self-starters do not suffer fools gladly. So they, if they have a boss that hasn't painted a clear direction about where the organization is going or where the team is going, hasn't painted guardrails about this is what you can do and what you can't do, um, dithers in terms of solving problems or acquiring resources, uh, they are not going to tolerate that very long. Of, of all the four followership types, this one may be actually the hardest to manage. It's the most valuable, but it's the hardest to manage because leaders really have to be on their A game when it comes to self-starters. Then we got brown nosers. So you look at the two characteristics here, you've got people who are super switched on, engaged. They want to see the organization succeed. They're willing to work hard to get tasks done, but they don't like to think. They like to be told what to do. All right. And so um, they're extremely loyal, uh, but, but they really, really have a difficult time making decisions or solving problems that may crop up in front of them. They're going to go back and check with the boss and make sure that everything's okay. The underlying psychological issue with these folks is self-confidence because many times they have all the technical expertise necessary to solve the problem, yet they, they're reluctant to make the decision. So um, one of the key strategies for leaders in, in, in when you've got people like this working for you is to put the monkey or put the problem back on the followers' shoulders. Ask them what they think they should do to solve the problem. Get them to solve the problem. The coaching in this case is all around boosting self-confidence. It's not around providing technical expertise on how to solve the problem. I will tell you that, that many, many leaders like to surround themselves with brown nosers because these are loyal folks who work hard and don't make any waves that never question the judgment of the leader. And many, many, many times leaders get in trouble when they surround themselves by brown nosers because they just basically tell leaders what they want to hear. Let's go over to slackers. Slackers are my stealth employees. So if you look at the two dimensions here, these are people who are disengaged and, and don't like to think about work. They spend more time trying to get out of work and hiding to get out of work and, and, and pretending they look real productive but not getting a whole lot done than uh, just about anybody. I remember reading a story in the Wall Street Journal about five or six years ago about this, this um, director for a water plant in Cadiz, Spain, who got an award for, uh, he got his 20 year service award. And, he, and, and in, the, in the award ceremony, they figured out he hadn't been at work for the last 20 years. And nobody had ever called him on and nobody even knew. You also read stories about people who have got two jobs working now where they've got two remote jobs, where they've got two different personas going on on LinkedIn. And they're just, you know, they're basically uh, slackers. Because they're working hard, but they're not working very, very hard. They're doing enough to get by for the organization. Um, slackers are really tough because, you know, one of the things to, to look about with slackers is, is many times people think they're not very motivated. In reality, uh, uh, these folks typically are highly motivated. 
If you look at somebody who doesn't work very hard, chances are they've got some sort of an activity or hobby outside of work that takes up all their time. They're big into fishing, they're big into hunting, they're big into flying, they're big into doing something other than work. So the key psychological issue for these folks is, is truly work motivation. And sometimes they're in the wrong job and that's what's causing the problem. Uh, other times leaders probably need to ease them out of the organization and ideally get them to work for a competitor. Um, and then the last quadrant is actually the most dangerous, criticizers. Because what you've got here is people who think really well. Uh, so they're really good at solving problems or really good at identifying issues and what might, uh, where a solution might go awry, but they're completely disengaged. And so their mission in life is to, is, is to just point out everything that the boss in the organization is doing wrong. So they bitch, whine, and moan about it. And, and what's really dangerous about criticizers is they like to um, they like to multiply. They like to create converts. So a lot of times somebody new will join the organization and you know get debriefed by the boss in terms of part of the onboarding process. Shortly thereafter, a criticizer will take them out to lunch and tell them, let me fill you in on what, what's really going on here. And so one of the things that we, uh, one of the things that leaders have got to do here is, is really address this criticizers head on. And the way you do that is when criticizers start to bitch and moan about a problem, again, it's almost like the same solution as we did with, with, with brown nosers. You put the problem on their shoulders, ask them how to solve it. They're really good at pointing out what's wrong. Say, okay, so how would we fix this? How could we make it better? And what you'll find is these folks are really reluctant to provide, provide inputs, but eventually if you work at them hard enough, they will. And if it's a solution you can live with, go with it. Because typically what happens with criticizers is that um, they've offered a number of solutions in the past that have been repeatedly shot down, maybe by previous bosses. And their underlying issue is one of recognition. And so the reason they whine, bitch, and moan and try to create converts is, 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 is this notion about gaining recognition. At one time, criticizers were self-starters. They got recognition for the job that they did. But because of a promotion that they may have missed out on or an org structure, they, they felt that, that, that maybe people didn't treat them right and they didn't uh, get the job they deserved, they've gone over to the dark side of followership. And so part of the coaching here is to try to get them the recognition they need to come back to the self-starter self -starter category. And what we end up doing with a lot of organizations and, and as we teach this model is we actually have leaders map out what kind of followers they have working for them right now. We actually have them map out, for example, using this uh, diagram here, if I can show it, we actually have, here's an example of, of, of somebody who ended up um, um, mapping their, their different follower types to, to um, the quadrants that we have listed out. And this can be really, really insightful for leaders to understand who do they have working for them? What kind of followers do they have working for them? And why may they have difficulties maybe getting stuff done in the organization? Another interesting little uh, thing to do here is oftentimes I will ask people in the audience to map out how their own personal followership style has changed over time. So I'll just say, you know, when you started work, what kind of follower were you? Write that down. And then did the type of follower you, uh, did it change over time? Did you change? You can see this person started out as a self-starter, spent some time as a brown noser, came back to the self-starter category, moved over to the slacker category for some time, and then actually uh, it, it became a criticizer. People move around in terms of their followerships type. And usually the number one reason why people move, both in a positive or negative sense, is how they're led. The leaders play a tremendous role in terms of uh, the kind of followers that they have uh, surrounding him or herself. Wow. <clears throat> what a great, uh, great model and a great opportunity for each of us as individuals to evaluate it evaluate ourselves, but also for uh, leaders to uh, evaluate their people and to uh, adjust their leadership style and, uh, and 
what a what a great tool you've given us. Thank you so very very much for sharing this, Gordy. I'm also intrigued about one of your axes, that critical thinking axis. That's certainly something we're we're thinking about here in the Civil Air Patrol. Why is this idea of critical thinking so important? And what tips can you give us about either ways to become more critically thinking or or perhaps uh, ways to use that skill or develop that skill? Well, if there's ever a field that was more riddled with fads and frankly BS, it's, it's the field of leadership. <laughs> I've been, again, I, I Tim, you, you and I both work in academia. You know, I, I, I call myself a recovering academic. Uh, you know, I continue to write and, and uh, continue particularly about leadership. And part of that charter is looking at, okay, what have we learned about leadership, say, over the last two or three years? And then how do we summarize it and make sense to people who in, in, in real leadership roles like, like you and, 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 your, and, and the audience? Um, there is really a lot of very bad information about the topic of leadership out there. And, and some of that stuff is quite popular. It sounds really good. It kind of, you know, it's like, boy, like a great one is popularity. Wouldn't it be great to be liked? Um, well, guess what? Being in a leadership role is not a popularity contest. Uh, uh, many, many times leaders have got to make tough decisions where they're not going to be liked very much, but it's the right thing to do as far as the mission. And uh, you know, if your bent is to be popular, then, then okay, fine, but you're going to have real, real difficulties making tough calls when they need to be made. And ultimately, the morale of the organization is going to go down because you're because of your unwillingness to make a tough call in and drive to be popular. All right. So critical thinking is super important when it comes to leadership, because it has to do with really having developed a deep subject matter expertise about a topic, looking at disparate pieces of information about a particular issue, holding a couple of different points of view about that issue that might be diametrically opposed? And what's the pros and cons of both? What are the assumptions under of, of both? And you know, <coughs> gathering data, and then over time and with, with experience, which path do I go? Which, which, how do I refine my viewpoint of say leadership? How do I refine my viewpoint of followership as I learn information, as I experience new things? Um, too many folks just look at stuff that confirms what they've already got. We've got confirmation bias going on where they have a point of view about a particular topic. And the only thing they look at is information that supports that point of view. What critical thinking is all about is look at different points of view. Look at issues from other angles. And what are other people saying about it? Because chances are they've got something intelligent to say about it. And, and you, know, you may not agree with it, but at least it's, it's worthwhile considering about, okay, why would people feel this way? And what does that do for us if we go down this path? So I think if there's anything that needs critical thinking, it is certainly the topics of leadership and followership, because it is, especially on the leadership side, 90% of what I read on leadership on LinkedIn or in, in articles and books is complete um, and utter nonsense. And essentially what critical, I'm going to use a highly technical term in psychology for critical thinking. Critical thinking is basically the size of your BS detector. You know, people with good critical thinking skills don't get fooled easily. They're not naive. They're very willing to listen to other points of view and consider other points of view and not go down a path too quickly before making decisions. People with, 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 with lower critical thinking skills are too quick to jump onto a solution. Uh, many times that solution is suboptimal and it ultimately leads to problems at the end of the day when, when that solution gets implemented. Oh, Gordy, again, great tips and great opportunity for us to evaluate ourselves and evaluate those who we lead. Well, we're coming to the end of our time, but uh, as always in, our, in these forums, I, um, and especially for someone like you, who's uh, a graduate of the Air Force Academy, on the faculty of the Air Force Academy, an Air Force officer, what, uh, what skills are open mic for you now? You've got 25,000 high school 
students out there uh, anxious to hear your wisdom, what would you like to tell the future leaders and followers of our country? What would you like to say? I think uh, the thing I've been working on over the last five or 10 years, and it's something that's largely been forgotten in terms of leadership, is that leadership is a team sport. Um, um, you know, we spend a lot of time looking at the individual characteristics of a leader. You know, how do we become a leader of character, which incredibly important. Don't get me wrong. But one of the things we oftentimes forget about is that leaders don't do it by themselves. You know, the bottom line is, is, is it, leadership is a team sport. There's going to be two people, five people, 20 people working for him, you, and you've got to get those folks working effectively together in order to get things done. And um, the more you can learn about leadership, the more you can learn about followership, and the more you can learn about teams and how do you actually build high performing teams is going to be really important for people uh, uh, in leadership roles. Well, again, spot on, uh, just an incredibly important topic for us in the Civil Air Patrol, both senior members and for cadets. And Dr. Gordy Kerfey, uh, thank you again so very much for joining me today and speaking to uh, the, the U.S. Air Force Auxiliary Civil Air Patrol. Uh, again, uh, thank you so much for your time, sir. And uh, we look forward to staying in touch with you and to, uh, to learn more about that. Hopefully we'll have another opportunity to talk later on and we look forward to learning more from you. Thank you again, sir. Thanks for the opportunity, Tim.